This program is intended to be general in nature and should not be used as a substitute for advice from a qualified health provider. On Health Matters, television for life, caring for a sick family member. A Spokane woman shares her story of going it alone as her husband battled ALS. Sometimes you just feel like you just carry on and do it by yourself. Until the phone call that changed everything. It was a huge relief. How Hospice of Spokane made the difference. Turning to end of life care, your options and advice. Right now on Health Matters. Health Matters is made possible by our viewers, the friends of KSBS, and by Providence Healthcare. I'm Dr. Andrew Boulay, and when my wife had a cardiac arrest, I chose Providence because I knew that everything we needed for her complex care was available, from the emergency room to radiology to the nursing staff to the specialists we needed for her care. My name is Beth Perez, and I am a registered nurse, and I work at Holy Family Hospital on the labor and delivery unit. I'm about to have my second child, and I chose Providence because I love and trust the people that I work with, and why wouldn't I seek care from people that I love and trust? Good evening, I'm Teresa Lukens. There are times when no amount of medical care will cure a disease, but that doesn't mean treatment stops. For some people, that means turning to palliative care. For others, end-of-life care. Tonight, we explore both in an important hour for anyone with a family member facing death. Here to bring compassion and dignity to this very tough topic is our panel. Dr. Nicole Pelly specializes in palliative care. She works for Kootenai Health in Coeur d'Alene. Kelly Durgan is a registered nurse and program manager in advanced care planning at Providence. Dr. Bob Bray is the medical director for Hospice of Spokane, Spokane Palliative Care, and Mobile Medicine of Spokane. And Dr. Wendy Knowlton is with Providence Palliative Care. She specializes in internal medicine. And welcome to all of you. And of course, we welcome your phone calls and questions. Join the discussion tonight. It's an important one and a chance for you to tap the expertise of our panel. I want to begin tonight by having all of you talk about exactly what you do, how you work with patients and uh, families for that matter, and how it fits into our topic. And Dr. Bray, we'll start with you. So as the medical director of Hospice of Spokane, that's where I spend most of my time. But I also do uh, inpatient palliative care consultations, and we have outpatient palliative care program through mobile medicine and, and um, Spokane Palliative Care. Okay. And Kelly? So I am lucky enough to work with individuals in a variety of settings, inpatient and outpatient, through our primary care clinics. Uh, we see patients in the hospital, patients that uh, at a variety of health and wellness, uh, as well as patients with some illness, and ask them to consider who they might trust to make decisions for them if they couldn't make them themselves, and to consider what if, what if I had a sudden illness or injury, or found myself so sick that I might die? How would I want my loved ones to direct my care? and to encourage conversation around that long before that time comes so that families know and are aware and can support one another through tough times. Okay, and Dr. Pelly. I work in an outpatient clinic with a variety of also patients, patients who have serious chronic illnesses who are going to get better from their disease, who are going to live with their disease, or who are going to die from their disease. Mm -hmm. um, I take care of patients with in-stage um, heart problems, in-stage lung problems, and cancer patients. So I meet them where they are within the trajectory of their disease. Some of them are facing final decisions about whether or not to continue chemotherapy. Some of them are choosing whether or not to do hospice. Or some of them are just pondering life's big questions and want a safe place to talk. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Knowlton. Hi, I'm Wendy Knowlton. I'm blessed and fortunate enough to be able to lead a, a large team that includes doctors, nurse practitioners, nurses, social workers, and others who are called upon in the, the inpatient and outpatient arena to support patients and their families with serious illness. And uh, it's, it's my honor. Mm -hmm. So a patient is most likely diagnosed, I guess we can start with that synopsis. Um, they're diagnosed with a terminal illness or a chronic illness. Who would be their first stop? They would see one of the palliative care doctors first, or Kelly, would they see you first to start 
planning the decisions they need to make. How does the process begin? Dr. Pelling? The process is as individual as our patients are. Um, and that's one of the things that unites all of us is that we join, we go to the poor the patient needs us to be, in other words. So sometimes it's a phys physician that they first see, sometimes it's advanced directives conversations. But we start the conversation in general by asking the patient, and one of the things that differentiates palliative care a little bit is that we ask the patient, where are you and what do you understand of your illness? because it gives us an idea each patient is in a different place. Maybe they just got their diagnosis and they're struggling to even comprehend that they are now terminal. Some patients have been doing this process for a long time. So if you start with where the patient is, that gives you a clue where to work from there. Mm -hmm. And how is what you do, Wendy, different from what Dr. Bray does, the hospice piece and the palliative care piece? That's a good question. <clears throat> you know, all hospice care is is palliative care, but there's a there's some Medicare regulations and some prognostication of um, if this disease runs its course at six months or less. And so, um, that is hospice. We um, those who are doing palliative medicine and palliative care, we seek to be upstream when there's still um, we don't know exactly what the prognosis is, but we know that um, the patient is facing. Um, a lot of tough decisions, uh, maybe facing a high symptom burden, and uh, we want to embrace the patient in a whole body uh, manner so that we're looking at the mind, body, and spirit. Um, so actually palliative care borrowed a lot of its philosophies from the, from the hospice uh, philosophy of care, but it's actually upstream. And so it's, uh, we don't have some of the same Medicare constraints that perhaps hospice would have. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bray, would you like to add to that? Well, you know, I think in, a, in an ideal world, it all starts with their physician, their, who is not a palliative care physician or not a hospice physician. So in an ideal world, that individual that they're trusting and that they get their initial prognostication from uh, is doing that primary palliative care and trying to help give the patient the information they need to then go on and make other decisions. And then we each get called upon at various, in various scenarios mm -hmm. when, when they need further help with that, whether it's help in making their decisions or help in symptom management. So hopefully in the beginning, the beginning starts with the folks that are dealing with uh, the, the physicians that are dealing with the patient um, early on. So I'm hearing that, uh, and in medicine now we often hear there's a team approach to treating a patient, but in this particular case, when we are at end of life, the team approach really does seem to come into play, Kelly. The team approach is so key in how we care for patients at a variety of health and wellness, uh, whether it is the social worker helping to uh, work through some of the psychosocial issues, some of, in the hospital, some of the discharge issues, where can we safely uh, take this patient and their family after discharge. Uh, our chaplains to really deal with the, the spiritual aspect, but it, it often starts in that primary care clinic and the variety of people that care for patients in a primary care setting. And then as we need more specialty care, whether it's a pulmonologist or an oncologist or a palliative care physician, there are a variety of people that will work together to make sure that we meet patients where they are and, and that a variety of needs can be met. So an evolving process. It's not one conversation you're having or one team that's put in place. It could be changing during the process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And to identify, as uh, Dr. Pelly described, what do you know about your illness? And maybe sometimes that's the first time families have really been able to say those words and start to process what this might look like. Uh, and for patients who just have a diagnosis of something like diabetes, mm -hmm. people can live for a long time with diabetes, but any chronic illness starts you on uh, additional risks. And one thing that we were talking about before uh, the program tonight is despite our hardest work and best research and incredible technology, we're all going to die. It's a fact. But okay. the focus for all of us is how do we want to live and how do we maximize that uh, every single day can be as good a day as we can have it be. Mm -hmm. And I imagine, Dr. Pelly, that patients will approach this in very individual and yes. many different ways. Um, what are some of the questions that you get initially 
um, when a patient is diagnosed and, and at the end of life. Um, and the emotional piece that kind of plays into that. Yeah, and palliative care, as you mentioned, is such a it's such an amalgam of um, physical support. Like um, some patients come and they're concerned about their pain or their shortness of breath, and so we can work with them on that. Some are more concerned about the emotional side of dying, leaving their families behind. Sometimes young parents are leaving children behind, and that's very very emotional. Um, and so we really do have to figure out what is worrying the patient the most. Um, our goal is to prevent suffering or to treat suffering. And I often call myself the moss between the cracks because I look for those places that haven't been covered yet. And you only do that by really finding out about the patient and their story. What's the story of this person? This isn't a cancer. This is a person with an illness. And so if I can find out who the person really is at their core and what their core values are and how they've lived their life up to this point, then that helps guide me over where some of the places that we may be able to do some work in. Some people aren't really, don't have much pain or aren't afraid of pain. Some people have a lot of pain. But it's figuring out who that person is as a person that is really the beginning anchor, I think, in palliative care. Mm -hmm. And working with the family, too, because, again, when you're talking team approach, the family has to, to be a part of that process. Absolutely. Uh, patients are, there's so much more to a patient than when we see them on their worst day when they're sick, they're not wearing their regular clothes, they're in the hospital bed, and they're feeling very vulnerable. Um, so we want to get to know them as a person. Um, what brings you hope? What brings you joy? Um, and I often will preface some of the questions I ask. I'm not trying to be nosy. I'm not trying to, you know, but I, I want to know more about you, how your mind works, um, who, who your support people are. And we start to um, get to know just a little bit of this, this wonderful human being that is before us that we're wanting to support through this journey. I think one of the misconceptions about palliative care is that it's an awful topic to talk about. My patients are often really scared when they come to see me sometimes, and I've even had a patient tell me they were warned, don't go see palliative care, they'll take away all your hope. But on the contrary, I think palliative care gives hope. So we focus on hope all the time. We hope, but we plan at the same time. And we also talk about the elephant in the room. So often in family situations, people don't want to say the word dying or death, and it's a hard thing to talk about at the dinner table. But when you have a patient surrounded by their family, and you can talk openly and honestly about these things, it's a safer place to have these conversations. And then the family hears the patient themselves expressing their wishes. Time after time, I get comments from family members, children saying, I didn't know you wanted that, Dad, really? And I think, oh, right, that was the whole purpose of today, is now their children know what they want to have happen after they die or during the process. Mm -hmm. How do you start those conversations? How do you break the ice, so to speak, and, and really start the process for any age person? I, I think the simplest way to do it is to just keep it simple and normalize it and just say, you know, many people want to talk about these things so that their family members know what to do and so on. So by just normalizing it and saying that this is something that a lot of people do and there's good reasons to do that, allow a lot of people to say, okay, well, then now I can kind of let down some of that anxiety in my guard a little bit and, and, and then speak honestly. So I think normalization is probably the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And a good place to start is to have an advanced directive. And that's where you come in, Kelly, is helping put that piece in place. What is an advanced directive and how do we get one? It's a great question. So an advanced directive is an umbrella term that refers to two separate decisions that people need to make. The first part is who do I trust to make medical decisions for me if I can't make them myself, either because I'm too sick or, or because of medications I've had or surgery or whatever it is. So that first part, who do I trust to make decisions? The second part is part of that normalizing conversation. What if, what if I got hit by a bus? And after a period of intensive care, they rush you to the hospital, they take you to the emergency room, they do all their things, off you go to the ICU, and then there's a period of pause. And the medical team comes to your family and says, you know what, I don't think she's going to get better. I don't think she's ever going to know who she is or where she is. How should we direct her care? And so that is the second part of the advanced directive, is what if you weren't going to get better? What level of intervention? What level of quality? Some people have really strict boundaries around what quality. I have to be able to live my, in my own apartment and take care of myself, all my own deal. Other people, 
don't have those kinds of boundaries around quality. A lot of people are somewhere in between. And so many family members say, oh, my family knows what I would want, but they don't. And so to be able to express that, um, but to start with that, what if, what if I got hit by a bus? Not because we have bad bus drivers, but because <laughs> things happen. So is there a series of questions on an advanced directive or are you just sort of jotting things down? Is it a legal document? It is a legal document. Um, and our durable power of attorney for healthcare to be executed in the state of Washington, it has to be either notarized or your signature must be witnessed by two people that you're not related to and don't work for the healthcare organization where you're being cared for. Um, so you could do it in a, in a family. Um, we always have extras at the Thanksgiving dinner table, so you could even do it there. Uh, there are notaries at your bank that can notarize a document. Uh, you can download documents from the internet, uh, provhealth.org slash AD. Uh, you can get an advanced directive that's legal in the state of Washington. Um, and it does ask you a series of questions. First of all, who would you choose? And an alternate even, uh, in case maybe you got hit by the bus together. And then the second part is, what level of care would I want if I were so sick that I might soon die? Then who gets that? So then you need to share that. You keep the original, not in your safety deposit box, but out where uh, it can be shared with your medical team. It should be in the medical record at a hospital where you might go. Uh, it needs to be shared with your family so that they know where it is and what it says because they're going to be the ones that will advocate for you if that time comes. Now we've seen, you know, dramatic television shows and that sort of thing where someone in the family will try to go against the advanced directive. Well, I don't think that's what really mother really wanted. Or So is that binding? If, if it's in an advanced directive, the doctors and the family, for that matter, have to go along with the wishes of the, the patient? It's a great question. And so, you know, as, as our condition changes, our wishes change. And the conversation that you start at the Thanksgiving dinner table evolves over time. And it may be that your wishes change and you didn't get to change your document. And so we encourage uh, families to tell us well, tell me what that conversation sounded like when they expressed different wishes. Because the goal is that that healthcare surrogate, the person making decisions for you, is using, we call it substituted judgment. Mm -hmm. Not what I want for my mom, but what did my mom want? And the best way for that to happen is to write down your wishes and to update your document when your wishes change. Okay, we have a phone call. Good evening, Larry, thank you for waiting. Hi, how Hi. are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Good. Um, I recently got out of uh, Providence hosp hos Hospital there, and when I was in there, my doctor was telling me that they found a brain aneurysm, okay? And I know what that means in the end. Here's what I'm calling about. Because I'm not married and I have no family in the area, how I don't want to get become like most men and they get angry. So how does somebody get around this? Are you wondering about when the end when when it's time for you to pass, yeah. Larry? What happens yeah. after that? And what well, you should no, do no, now? No, no, no. I'm saying that I I've just seen a lot of men who get very angry at the sight of death. Okay. And yeah, the emotional be... piece. Dr. Nelton? Yes. Hi, Larry. Thanks for being brave enough to, to call in. Um, the first thing I would recommend is um, that you designate someone to be your medical surrogate. If you don't, I, I think it's important that you know in the state of Washington there is a legal hierarchy. So um, if, uh, if you designate someone, if it's your illegal spouse, if you have any uh, adult children. Um, so there's, there's a hierarchy if you have any adult siblings. So those people by default, would the doctors would turn to um, ask um, what you would say is regarding your medical care unless you specify those things. So um, I know I'm not answering your question specifically, but it sounds like you're vulnerable in that way, that you, you need a person. Um, do you have a person, Larry? That that's... I don't think he's still on the line. Dr. Okay. Milton, but yes. Yeah. So that would be my that would be mm -hmm. my... even a close friend. Yes, and it, and it's someone that. Um, so I think it's important that that 
people who are in Larry's situation know that um, you may have relatives that you haven't spoken to for 20 years, but bec if they exist and they're there, then someone will have to, by law, reach out and try to find them. So it might be in his best interest to designate a good friend that he trusts to be his medical person. Mm -hmm. Then the next step would be uh, maybe to talk to his health care uh, provider about getting some support. Mm -hmm. He also talked, Dr. Pelly, about being afraid that he was going to be angry. Yeah, and I wanted to address the anger piece mm -hmm. because it's an, it's an emotion that we see very commonly in somebody who gets a sudden diagnosis or who realizes that they're at risk for a sudden death. Um, anger, perhaps that this is not the way we expected it to turn out. Anger that this is not what we wanted, that we love life and we want to have more of it. And I find that witnessing that anger, simply witnessing, because anger is a form of suffering. And sometimes what you need to do is express that anger. Say those things out loud, either to your healthcare professionals or to somebody who's close to you. Express that anger and realize that simply by expressing that anger and allowing that emotion to be witnessed, oftentimes that really helps that. Because mm. he almost sounded like he wanted to suppress it in some way, and that's that's, that's not, not the, the way to go. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to let it out, actually. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're here for. We're here to witness that suffering. And to help through the process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, faced with a terminal illness, some families do turn to hospice, which focuses on caring and not caring, and in most cases, it's provided in a patient's home. A Spokane woman turned to hospice care for her husband, a decision she says made all the difference. This is how Jaredette Seger remembers her husband. He was a very adventurous, spontaneous man. Got along with everybody. Everybody loved Jim. A man who enjoyed hiking and running in Bloomsday. So even before he was diagnosed with ALS, it was obvious that something was wrong. One of the things that I noticed was that his gait was slower than mine for some reason, and it was always faster than mine. And there were other signs. One of the things that really bothered him is he was dropping things. As the disease progressed, Jaredette cared for her husband in their home. When he started falling in the house, I needed to just step down from work and be there. She says it never occurred to her that she needed help. As a primary caregiver, you get so wrapped up in just caregiving that you just keep on keeping on. Until someone suggested she call Hospice of Spokane. I wished I had called sooner. The Hospice of Spokane team brought in medical equipment, made sure medications were delivered, and provided respite care. The help was really genuine. I mean, very, very sincere people. And that help allowed Jaredette to be Jim's wife again. The regret was that I had spent so much time caring for him that I couldn't be his wife. The Sagers had Hospice of Spokane in their home for two months, time that prepared them for what was to come. I was able to be there with Jim, and Jim was able to be there with me right through the very end, till his last breath. 10 years later, Jaredette looks back, knowing they made the right choice. I think that's the huge advantage for hospice, is that you can be the spouse and they can do everything else. All of our healthcare professionals nodding when she said that she could be there as, as his wife at the end. And, and she said it, um, Dr. Bray, um, that it, they turned to hospice too late, that she wished they had done it sooner so that she could be there uh, for her husband as a wife and not a caregiver. And you hear that story quite often, don't you? One of the most common things we hear from families in surveys after the death of their loved one is that they wish they had done it sooner. And, you know, this is a process that's, and life isn't perfect, and trying to go about caring for people at the end of life isn't perfect either. But I think the important thing are all those things that she mentioned um, that are so important that hospice can help bring to someone. Um, you know, w one of the things that we do in the process of, of caring for folks is making sure that they have the confidence that they can do their part in caring for their loved one. They don't have to be the one to always rack their brain. Are they anticipating the next step the way they should be? They have professionals that are there that are helping them to do that. Uh, so I think that uh, there's a lot of myths about hospice care, and one is that 
Well, hospice it happens when you lose hope in something else. Or you've given up. Or they've given up or there's nothing else that can be done. That's when our work starts. And, uh, and so um, we, get, we are trying to make sure that people understand there's always hope. Mm -hmm. hope what you're hoping for may change. If, you can't, if you're not hoping for a cure any longer, what are you hoping for? Are you hoping for a good day-to-day -day with the grandkids? Are you hoping to see the, that, uh, that child, that grandchild graduate from, from high school? Whatever those goals are, we try to help them see how they might be able to reach those. So there's always hope in what we do. I often see that patients feel like hospice is a failure, like they're going to choose hospice because now they've failed and there's nothing else to turn to. So one of my jobs on the outpatient side is to encourage patients to do that much earlier because hospice does offer hope and it's a different system of caring, but it doesn't mean that we're giving up on you. There's still care available. It's a different kind of care. It's a care when you don't want to go spend time in the emergency room anymore, where you don't want to spend your life going to doctor's visits. But it doesn't mean that the caring stops. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about hospice, mm -hmm. that it's for the last few days of life, for the last week of life. Mm -hmm. But in fact, hospice can go on for six months. Some people actually come off hospice and they go back into hospice at a later point in time. So I also hear the same thing from my patients. Their regret is that they don't choose hospice earlier. We have another phone call from Mary Lou and Shalann. Hi, Mary Lou. Hi. Thank you for holding on. You're welcome. You're welcome. I just wanted to say that I have filled out a form called the Five Wishes, and uh, this is in place of what you all have been talking about, the main document. And um, it, uh, has, it has you uh, tell um, uh, how you want to be treated um, in the hospital. They're more like some emotional things. and. Um, it t asks, what would you like said on your funeral? Mm -hmm. So it, I, I like it very, very much. So I just wanted to make a, make a statement for the five wishes. Well, we appreciate that. Thank you, Mary Lou. Can you talk more uh, about that? Absolutely. Five Wishes is a, uh, 20 years, I think, Five Wishes has been around for a long time. It's a, a legal advanced directive in many states, and it, it asks rich and thought-provoking questions and can really help families and caregivers uh, have that big picture idea of what, what is at the heart and soul and core of that person. So there are lots of different advanced directives and one is not better or more right than the other. It's what suits that person and the way they want to explore and express the things that are important to them. Even if they write a statement on a piece of paper and sign it and have it notarized or witnessed, that can be an advanced directive. That statement of what is important to me? How, how am I as an individual? What things are so important to me that, that I want to share with other people? You can get quite detailed too. She mentioned you, you have what you want to say at your funeral. Mm -hmm. Funeral, excuse me. Um, you know, I, I imagine you could put down the songs you want played or any kind of special things you want. You can, and so an advanced directive, ideally you're communicating not only with your family but with your medical team. And so there are lots of other ways that you can communicate with your family things that you want done at your funeral or your burial or your possessions. So there's lots of, of information that we need to share with people that we love to prepare them for after we're gone. Uh, but. The advanced directive, hopefully it primarily communicates with your family who will then interpret that for your medical team. Mm -hmm. What are some of the questions you get from patients when they're faced with those end of life choices that the, maybe some of us wouldn't even think about until we're put in that position? Yeah, I, I, um, I failed to mention that I was a hospice medical director in Tennessee, my home state, for seven years before coming to Spokane. And um, it's such a privilege to to be at the bedside of someone who is uh, facing this amazing transition. And sometimes the, the patient is the one who sees it coming and they're looking for a confidant in the room who can bear the reality that they're going to transition. And so they'll find hope and, oh, I can actually, am I, am I dying? It's a, I've had patients ask me that. And only then will I actually um, discuss it openly and I'll pull up a chair and say, well, what do you think? What do you feel in your body? And then we'll kind of go from there. Mm -hmm. 
Um, patients very often when they're facing end of life are concerned about two things. They're concerned about being a burden to their family and they're concerned about being in pain. And I, over the years, the last, I don't know how many years I've been doing this, 15 years, um, have realized that the more information that patients and families can have, the more upstream they can have these conversations, um, the more joy, compassion, um, the less burden some the serious illness time can be. Is there a sense of empowerment as well? Empowerment, absolutely. Yeah, so as we near Thanksgiving, we were talking about how people will be coming together that you haven't seen in a while, and it's an opportunity to talk. Yeah. And it's those times, though, when we tend to avoid the topic, and it's the very time when maybe it's a good time to broach the topic. It's a great time to broach the topic. Um, I think that one of, the other con one of the other questions that can be really useful at this point in time is what's unacceptable to you? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. often patients are very clear on Go what they the other don't direction. want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to end up in an ICU setting with a breathing tube in and connected to lots of machines. They know what they don't want. But so often, not ending up where you don't want to be starts with conversations back here. But if you can at least express where you don't want to end up, then you can sometimes change the trajectory of that. And that's what I try to talk to my patients about, is having these conversations early, discussing what's unacceptable to you, then allows your family to hear that. And then if you end up in a setting where that's the likely outcome, you can sort of divert and not end up there. So it's a good question to use about what's unacceptable. I've had patients say it's unacceptable to me to die without my pets by my side. And that's a wonderful thing for a family member to know about their loved one, that they want to find a way to keep their pets close by. I've had patients say it's unacceptable to be, to be connected to oxygen and walk around carrying oxygen all the time. Whereas to other people, carrying oxygen around is just fine. So it's, it's a really great question. What's unacceptable to mm -hmm. you? Yeah, that's an approach I wouldn't have thought of. You know, it's sort of turning, yeah, it on turning its it on its head because we... One of, my, one of my patients' greatest fear is ending up in a place they don't want to be. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to be here. How did we end up here? This is not what mom or grandma would have wanted to be. She never would have wanted to end up in the hospital like this. Well, if we know those things, how do we then downstream say, let's make the right choices that don't get us where she didn't want to be? Mm -hmm. And hospice, early choice of hospice, is a great way to do that. So early conversations, hope but plan, plan with advanced directives, and then when we face these medical junctures where we have to make decisions or family, have, family members have to make decisions, if family members can answer, it's unacceptable to dad that he would ever end up in this situation, then that helps your medical providers give you the advice and help family members make the choices to not go down a path where they end up where they didn't want to be. Mm -hmm. And when they do finally choose hospice care, Dr. Bray, and that care is going to be done in the home, and maybe that's where mom wanted to be, was at home. Um, how do you start that process of knowing what that patient then needs and providing what they need? I think that's a, a lot of uh, families wonder, well, I don't even know where to begin to start that process. So the good news is it's actually a very easy process, and it happens very quickly. Um, so someone who decides they want to have hospice care, they, get, they make the call, the background stuff happens where the hospice admission team will contact their physician, make sure that they indeed have a, a prognosis of six months and that they have the, the direction from the physician to get started. Um, the patient gets seen. They have, they have a professional that's going to assess what their needs are, make sure that their goals align with hospice services. And, uh, and then usually within that first day, um, if that's the decision, uh, the patient's admitted, the, the process of starting to get their medication supplied by the hospice services for the, for the terminal condition, um, DME that needs to be there is going to be there within 24 hours typically. So it can be, it can be a very rapid um, uh, process of getting that whole thing started. And there again, the patient, the family doesn't have to figure out what they need. Mm -hmm. They're getting professional services to come in and try to help them determine what may be useful, and it's all chosen, accepted or not, by the patient based on 
you know, what they want. And doing it in a way that doesn't really, tries not to disrupt their life too much in a process if there is equipment exactly. and items that need to be brought in. Exactly. We have a, an email from Sally in Coeur d'Alene and she asks, what the uh, first step in end of life preparation uh, would be upgrading your will, if that would be the first step, and what's next after that, and that's Sally and Coeur d'Alene. So do you start with the will and go from there? So uh, a will for most people is done with an attorney and it, it is dealing with your estate, with your things. Uh, and so an advanced directive and directing your medical care doesn't have to be done with an attorney. And in fact, I think it's much better done uh, with people who speak plain English uh, with questions that are familiar. And, and some of the questions that I always ask is, what's a good day look like? And that describes that, that quality that's acceptable. And follow-up questions that I always ask is, what do you hope for and what do you worry about? Because I think that helps families get some concept of, of some of those unacceptable outcomes and what are acceptable outcomes. Um, so that advanced directive uh, puts the, the medical pieces together. And then the, once you've figured those things out, then it's communicating those wishes to your primary care physician and to your family. Uh, and then your primary care physician in turn can share that with others who'll need to know, like the hospital that you might go to uh, in Coeur d'Alene, that would likely be Kootenai. And if that's in your medical record, then it's there and present. And we can't honor wishes if we don't know what they are. So that is an important piece of not tucking it away with your important papers in your safety deposit box, but sharing it with your medical team so that we're aware. You know, one of the important questions that I help my patients with is how to answer that question of do you want to be resuscitated or not? Mm. And the real, one of the important things about this question is that how that question is asked often gives a different answer. So if the question is asked, if, you, if your heart stops, do you want us to try to restart it? Oftentimes the patient will say, well, yes, of course. But if you explain that in that situation, your heart has stopped, your breathing has stopped, You've actually died at that point. And what are your wishes then? Mm. Do you want to be brought back? And when you explain oftentimes what the resuscitation can look like and entail and how you may end up in the ICU connected to machines that you don't want to be, when you really explain that process and what that can look like. It's not just black and white. It's not black and white. And so there's a lot of judgment involved, but people often make a different choice when they realize that they've already died and they'd like to allow a natural death at this point. And this is often true in people with terminal illnesses anyway. When they're facing death, they realize that if they die of a sudden and unexpected reason, they really don't want to attempt a resuscitation at that point. But how that question is asked and painting the picture of that really, really is important. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an important conversation to have with medical people who can explain what that looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's an ongoing conversation too, because um, Kelly and I have learned um, over the years that, you know, you have had patients who have serious illnesses that are specifically in the cardiac realm. Um, there are scenarios where, you know, advanced cardiac techniques may actually be beneficial in those, in those situations. Um, so it's, it's, it's usually an ongoing conversation. And in those situations, kind of talking about the big picture of where we, is there an unacceptable outcome that if we start seeing that that's on the horizon, we ought not go that way. Um, that can be very informative in that particular cardiac situation where you're, um, you're not wanting to, to deny anyone anything, but you want to not lose the person and the person's values along the journey. And we're getting better at that, I think, as physicians, where we're less maternalistic or paternalistic in, as opposed to in dictating things because there's so much technology now that can be brought to the patient that we realize now people are living longer, sicker, with symptoms that they've never had before. And then we have to pause and say, wait a minute, um, does that align with what the patient would have wanted? And so we, we've gotten a lot better now at pausing and circling back around and saying, wait a minute, um, ought we offer that? Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of phone calls we want to get to. Beck in Calgary. Hi, Beck. Hi. Thank you for calling. Do you have a question? Yes, I have a question. 
there is a lady uh, who is related to me who is uh, who has been uh, suffering from uh, urinary uh, blockage mm. be, uh, as a result of a complication of cancer treatment mm. and uh, uh, as a result she has been going from one urologist to another to another uh, but now she is, she is put in a column of dementia. Mm. Uh, you know, the waste paper basket in which she put everything. And uh, she has no dementia. She, her memory is quite fine. Uh, she talks to you quite nicely and so on. But uh, I don't know how to solve the problem of this lady. Uh, because there are people who are interested in keeping her in that situation, mm. and how to liberate her from that situation is my problem. Okay. Is this a relative back? I beg your pardon? Is she a relative? Yes. Yes. Uh, a, a close relative? Very close. <laughs> okay. Um, he's in a situation where he sort of feels helpless. How does he help her in this situation? Any advice? My first thought is uh, help. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to have a conversation if you're uncomfortable. It's hard to um, talk about anything else if your bladder is distended and, and things aren't flowing. So um, I would encourage the caller to um, start with this better symptom control. And um, that is something that modern medicine can do something about. So I'm advocating for the person to have better symptom control and then um, maybe asking for um, a conversation, a goals of care conversation. What are our goals? Where are we headed? What's next? But he needs to speak up. I, I think so. I think so. Um, sometimes not making a decision is making a decision, um, especially in the the U.S. Uh, medical culture, where we have default stances, and there are things that we do until we're told not until until we're told not to, um, good, bad, or indifferent. That's kind of the way it is, and so we want to talk about it before we find ourselves doing our default mm -hmm. of doing. And also starting with asking, what does the patient want? What does she want? Mm -hmm. We forget sometimes because we're so highly trained, and we want to fix, and we want to cure, and we want to do because that's what we do so well. But it's also okay to say, I don't want to do anymore. That's an okay decision to make. And that's not always what a patient's going to think about when they go to their doctor. I often have patients who are afraid to tell their physicians they, they don't want to continue doing treatment because they're afraid of disappointing their doctors. Mm -hmm. So I, in palliative care, try to be that open-minded individual they're not going to disappoint, but to lay the full spectrum out for them from aggressive treatment to no treatment and what that pathway can look like too. So figuring out what the patient wants, providing the full spectrum of options rather than just the treat, 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 I think that's an important thing to think about as well. Okay. And something that we can improve on in medicine as we, it is currently practiced. All right. Sharon, hi Sharon, you're uh -huh. here in Spokane. Thank you for calling. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. uh, thank you. Uh, I just happened to turn over and this is a subject near and dear to my heart. I've had two husbands that have died one of lung cancer and the second one of COPD in both instances. One time was here in Spokane 23 years ago and the other was 10 years ago in Monterey, California. Both instances, my first question to my, to my husband's doctor here in Spokane when we discovered he had lung cancer was, should I be contacting hospice? And, and it was, and he said, not quite yet. Well, he, the next day said, yes, you should be contacting hospice because I'd done my research ahead of time and knew that that meant possibly the prognosis was 10 months or, I mean, six months or less. And it was, it turned out to be three and a half months. Mm -hmm. But my experience with both situations, though unique to each husband and their personalities were different and how they handled things were different. My, my positive, um, uh, experience with hospice both times was just tremendous, just amazing. Two different organizations, one was the VNA hospice, 
The other was Hospice of Spokane, and yet both were absolutely excellent. But it also t- taught me something else. I'm now 73 years old, and the first time I was a widow at 47, but it taught me something else, and that was that, and I also worked in a hospital in Monterey for 10 years and admitting. I learned that it's important to have these discussions with our loved ones much sooner than later, that, that no one knows how long they're going to live. And so making your wishes known to those that you love and writing them down at even I had talks with my grandchildren in their teen years about their choices and about my choices Mm. that I was making. And the other thing I did, I did the five wishes also, but I also wrote out a sheet that has all the demographic information. Having been through that, I wrote out who my parents were, where they were born, where they died. Uh, uh, my siblings, my children, my uh, and wh- where they live, all that information that would have to go in an obituary or that they need to know mm-hmm. for Medicare or anyone else. I re- I've got that all written out. That's with the five wishes. Uh, and I also made a copy of e- both of those, and I've hand-carried them to my loved ones, that uh, I, my daughters, all three of my daughters, and my brother, who would be the executor. And, well, Sharon, and, it's... It sounds like you have more insight than, than most people, and we really appreciate your, your comments tonight. Uh, very wise, and it sounds like, um, uh, unfortunately, you've had to go through that two times, but we so appreciate your insight. And she's right. She talked to her, her teenage grandchildren mm-hmm. about the topic, something we don't often do. We don't want to scare kids. We don't want to put them in a position of feeling like they have to make adult choices, but it is a fact of life. When you look at the the poster children for advanced care planning, they were young women in their 20s. Uh, Karen Ann Quinlan in the 70s, Nancy Cruzan, um, even Terry Schiavo. So unexpected things happened to them and their families were left wondering what would they want. And as a parent uh, of children in their 20s, I, I can't imagine having to make that decision for my own children without having some idea of what what would they want and what outcomes would not be okay with them? And so to have that conversation across the continuum because you truly never know. Mm-hmm. And, and speaking of kids, um, parents are put in that situation. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Um, I was listening to Sharon, you know, there's this whole spectrum of openness and interest in um, having these conversations and being ready um, to the point where, well, I don't want the other end of the spectrum from Sharon is, I don't want to talk about it because talking about it will make it happen. Um, and so those cases are, it's helpful to inform people that the default stance is X if no documents are completed. Um, but regarding children, yes, our program um, cares for patients any age, any stage. And uh, we do take care of neonates and children who are uh, facing serious illness, absolutely. And sometimes kids have a clarity um, about them when it comes to facing death, even more so than adults do. They do. Kids have such a wisdom about Mm -hmm. them. And what I've always found fascinating, because I've also cared for children at the end of their lives within hospital settings, and there's, there's a piece about them. There's often something where, as long as you have good pain control, they're not fighting the dying process in the same way that many adults fight it. And I'm talking two, three, four, five-year-olds, mm-hmm. kids who really m- have much more understanding of the dying process than I would ex- have expected a child that age to have. So it goes back to trust the wisdom of what you're seeing in front of you in the patient that's expressing it to you mm-hmm. and, and believe when kids are at peace that maybe we ourselves as adults and as physicians and as care providers in the hospital can also learn. And I've often said my pediatric patients have been some of my greatest teachers when it comes to the dying process. Mm-hmm. They're not as afraid as we adults are. And how do you have those conversations with parents to make sure that they're doing what they need to do when they're suffering through such a traumatic time? Well, it's it's very difficult. And I think, you know, what we try to do um, at Hospice of Spokane with our pediatric patients is, uh, again, trying to make sure that we start at the point of good symptom control, Mm -hmm. make sure that we have everyone's confidence uh, in in that regard. And um, and I, I... can recall some very memorable times when it was something that the child said that really allowed the parent to say, okay, it, it really is okay for us to, 
to step back and, and allow this natural process to occur. Um, so uh, I think that's really the big key is listening to them and, and, and taking cues from them. It's very, very hard to let go as a parent and we completely understand that. Mm -hmm. And again, bring your support team in, whether it's family or your care team and have that emotional support, especially for parents. Uh, we have Holly on the line from Spokane. Hi, Holly, thank you for waiting. Yes, hello. Hi. Um, I, I, I took care of my mom at home, and um, actually I took her uh, back to a home where we both had, both had lived before in Colville, so not exactly in Spokane. But um, I, was, I didn't want to put her on hospice. The doctor had called and suggested it several times, and I didn't want her to feel that I had given up, mm. and I didn't, I didn't know how to deal with this. She, we were the last two members of our family, so it's all on my um, watch. And so I had a friend who was a, a mutual friend of mother's and mine who was a, ho a hospice volunteer. And she offered to come over and talk to mom about it. Mm -hmm. And that really broke the ice. And so um, with the thought that you can graduate off hospice, that's mm -hmm. a very positive thought. And I know Father Alby here in Spokane, who did graduate from hospice, mm -hmm. uh, even though he had to go back on it later. And um, uh, I have... Um, I have reservations about the expression that I've heard that you can then be just her daughter again or just be the wife again. Um, I didn't give up being a caregiver because I had hospice come in. My mother and I became very close with all the personal attention caregiving allows. And um, so I was caregiver and daughter, not one or the other. Mm -hmm. And um, that always just rubbed my foot personally, my fur the wrong way. Um, and the hospice people were terrific. I have nothing but good things to say, and they really took the load off the total responsibility being on me, the bathing, the, the communication, the, um, the, uh, per, the chaplain who came, and all of those kinds of things. And I did get respite care, which I, I really benefited from, as did Mom, I'm sure. Well, so um, I just wanted to express that business about being you. no longer being the caregiver, but, but just being the daughter, uh, because that's, that's not totally true. All right. So. Holly, thank you so much for your comments tonight. Um, mm -hmm. It upset her, but that's, that's what worked for her, was bringing in that, uh, just even some help. Yeah, really, the two things I wanted to say about that. One is that... Um, Although earlier I talked about how rapidly you can mobilize hospice resources, you can also ask for an evaluation that doesn't have to result in a decision at that point so that you can understand better how hospice might, might be helpful for you. So that is how it can start for some people as well, and they may think about it and make a decision later. The, the other comment that she had about the caregiver versus the, versus the daughter it underscores that when we're, when we're taking on a patient, we're also taking on a family. And what it is that is needed is gonna be, we're gonna address the needs of the patient and we're also addressing the needs of the family. And, um, and it's very clear that one of the needs was for her to remain the caregiver of her mother and make sure that she wasn't, um, she wasn't in a position where she felt like she had to give any of that up. And absolutely you don't. So, I think that's the that's the other key is we really we really have the patient and the family that we're that we're taking care of at the same time. We've talked a lot about the emotional sport and um, the sport of family. What about the spiritual piece? Um, can you bring in your your priest or your pastor <coughs> too to be a part of the process so that they know your wishes as well? Absolutely, uh, we have done a great job, I think, learning from the hospice philosophy of care that uh, people are mind, body, spirit, and that palliative care is best delivered in an interdisciplinary team approach. It's not only this, the doctor going in or the, the nurse going in or the chaplain. It's, there's an assessment that needs to be made, of course, and uh, people can definitely have uh, concerns and suffer in different components of themselves. So there's something called the National Consensus Project and it helps inform our specialty in medicine where there's different domains 
within palliative care and a person's spirituality, where they find hope, where they find peace, and where they find meaning is an absolute part of that. Um, if, if you miss that, you've missed palliative care. Mm -hmm. Kelly? I think that, that there are some people, even as they consider how they might want to be cared for at the end of their life, to include a spiritual advisor if there are parts that, that they're unsure of or that they, they are worried about to include that input as they make their plans, whether it's, I wanna be anointed or I wanna have these people with me. Uh, all those things can be what we express to our families and to our medical team in things that we want to have done and the way we want it to happen. It's, it's as individual as the person and what they believe in and what they hold dear. Okay. Oftentimes, um, when you bring the spiritual component in, you find that there are ceremonies that are very important, regardless of the spiritual tradition. And that's one of the important parts, I think, is what ceremony is important to the patients that we should know about ahead of time so that we can support. I find patients are often afraid to bring that up to their physicians because they think, oh, the physician doesn't want to hear that or they're not going to understand. But in fact, that's really, really important and we do want to hear that and we do want to understand how we can better support those traditions. Okay. We're getting uh, close to the end of our program, so I, I want each of you to leave our, our viewers tonight with a final thought when we're talking about end-of-life care and those choices. Dr. Bray, briefly. You know, I think what underscores a lot of what it is we've talked about is time. It takes time to have these conversations. It takes time for families to consider what it is that they want to do. And at the same time, when it comes to hospice, um, waiting too long is something that can be, we wish we had that time back. Mm -hmm. We can try to control symptoms very quickly, but we can't really talk to people about their spiritual pain. We can't talk to them about what kinds of reconciliation they want to have in their own family within the course of an afternoon. It takes more time than that. So we encourage people to, to utilize those services as early as it seems appropriate for them. Okay. Just a few seconds, Kelly. Think about these things while you're well, well before the crisis. Let, let your family know what's important to you, who's going to make decisions if you can't. It's a fabulous gift. Dr. Pelly. Don't be afraid of saying the word, I'm going to die. We're all going to do it. And what I think we need as a society to bring that back into the normalization, to realize that that's a perfectly normal thing to talk about rather than being afraid of it. And finally? And go out and live. The secret's out. We're all going to die. <laughs> so right. let's live. And go to provhealth.org and check out the documents that are there. Mm -hmm. might help you with your decision making. And we have also posted those at ksps.org, some of the information that you'll need after the show. And that will do it for this edition of Health Matters. Thank you to the panel for a great discussion. And our thanks as well to everyone who called in or emailed a question to us. We will be back on December 21st for our annual cooking show. And this year we are teaming up with Second Harvest Food Bank to bring you some delicious dishes. So we'll help you join us then. It's always a ton of fun. We hope that uh, you'll tune in in December. And until then, I'm Teresa Lukens. Good night. Health Matters is made possible by our viewers, the friends of KSBS, and by Providence Healthcare. I'm Dr. Andrew Boulay, and when my wife had a cardiac arrest, I chose Providence because I knew that everything we needed for her complex care was available, from the emergency room to radiology to the nursing staff to the specialists we needed for her care. My name is Beth Perez, and I am a registered nurse, and I work at Holy Family Hospital on the labor and delivery unit. I'm about to have my second child and I chose Providence because I love and trust the people that I work with and why wouldn't I seek care from people that I love and trust.